We're having this second uh, session in the um, it says video. We're talking about this particular area and the plants and some of the local history and particularly the history of the last couple of hundred years because we covered the ancient history back 60,000 years on our beach walk. So this area is a very, very special area that's just been panned and it's an area of importance to Aboriginal women in particular. Among other things, it was a special birthing place. And the local tribes uh, we're going to talk about, in particular, are the Bunwarang. And I've got a map here. This is a map of the Bunwarang, and they have the area from Port Phillip Bay through Western Port and down. And Bunwarang means the Bun speakers. Warang means the speaker. Bun means the language. And uh, and the uh, Warang, sorry, is the language and one of the local tribe. And there are many others around here with exactly the word Warang in them. Woi Warang, Watharang, all those others indicating they're part of the same big group through here. Um, now the Bun Warang themselves are broken down into five small clans, or six small clans. And one of them, one of the clans was the Nagarak Ulam. And they had the clan that occupied this area. And their numbers got up to about 60, 80 to 100 at times sort of people who lived here, they weren't the stone home builders and things of many other places, they lived in fairly standard um, humpy type accommodation. And this is an image of a very famous Aboriginal, Jimmy Dunbar. And Jimmy was the last, the last of the local Aboriginal, local full blood. Because when we arrived, we began a a program of dispossession of our Aboriginals. We did things like um, uh, the behind me out here, uh, a few kilometres, there was a vast swamp that ran all the way from St Kilda down to uh, Kuirup. And that was full of magpie geese, brolga, even brolga down here. Magpie geese are now only up in the Northern Territory. We uh, drained the swamps and the fish and everything to do with them and then we moved the Aborigines out because that was a major area of food source for them. Among other things, had a yam daisy, and I'll talk about that when I get over to the stones here. But the yam daisy was their potato. And uh, the thing that happened, which we didn't expect to do, was that when we bought animals out here, European animals, there's a significant difference between them and every Australian animal. And that difference was that we bought out hard hoofed animals, pigs and cows and sheep and horses and more. And this land's not made for that. So inadvertently, those animals chomped, chomped the land, went into farms, all those sort of things, and chopped through the root system so the yam daisies virtually all died out. And someone said to me once, well, you know, they could eat something else instead of these yam daisies, which were their potato. I said, you should have told that the Irish in 1900, when the potato famine drove half the country away and the country faced starvation. So that was just one of the things we did, including demoralisation. The biggest thing we did was bring European diseases because the local people had no resistance whatsoever to things like smallpox and many other diseases. And uh, in our, you know, any of us who'd been susceptible to smallpox died, and the others who could handle it lived on and bred. But when we came here, coughed on them, they're in deep trouble. And how long did it take? Well, fundamentally, we arrived in 1840, and 37 years later. Every local full blood Bunwarang is dead. And the last was Jimmy Dunbar and his wife Nancy. And there they are. Handsome people, strong people. But they, they died in uh, 19, 1830, um, 1877. Pretty sad. So now I think we'll walk over and have a look at the um, the uh, stone statue over here and I'll tell you what that's meaning and what it's all about. Hi. 
This sculpture here represents, as they say on the plaque, the Bunwarang blossom. But in fact, talking to a number of people with some experience, I think it also represents the yam daisy that I mentioned before. And in passing with the yam daisy, we thought the Aboriginals were itinerant people moving, but of course they weren't at all. They actually farmed in large, vast farms like our market gardens, the yam daisy right across from New South Wales through Victoria into South Australia in a vast swathe. And on top of that again is where they put the, um, the grain and, and carried on with, with that. Statue is the dominant feature here and we uh, often bring people here to show them uh, what it's all about and begin this talk on Aboriginal foods. Now, in particular we're here to talk about food. <coughs> I'm just turning away from the road noise because there was plenty of food. The Aboriginal men locally only had to work about 10 to 16 hours a week catching animals. But sometimes the, uh, the water rats, the echidnas, the possums, everything else that was here just wasn't available. And anyone will know who's been hunting that at times when no animal seems to appear. And sometimes too out there on the water where they would go out with, the fight with brands burning, uh, Malaluka brands, and spearing fish in the water at night, the water was too rough, so getting food was very difficult. So the women and the children, and they do it pretty routinely anyway, would come down here into this area and begin to collect food. And I think you'd be fascinated when you find out just how many different foods, almost every plant here has a purpose, and they're the things I'd like to talk about. Before I start on this very special plant here, this little one down here, I'd like just to mention something of real interest. The Aboriginal numbers were very low, and they kept them low. But that would also mean if you're not careful, there'd be a lot of inbreeding and real problems, and they had none of that. And we've only recently discovered, or I've only recently discovered, that at uh, Morty Alec, local Nagarak Willem and other Bunwarang people, would meet once a year for a big jambana. And the big jambana was a party on the banks of the Morty Alec Creek, because the eels came up the creek in March each year. And at that time, Around the, around the area through here would come the um, Watharong men to find themselves wives in, the, uh, in this area and take them away. So of course the Watharong would then breed with the, uh, the Bunwarang and the children of the Watharong Bunwarang would then marry out perhaps to the Wurundjeri up just north of Melbourne. And so you'd maintain a high level of genetic strength in the community. And I think that's terrific. And at one stage, um, uh, 800 years ago, the bay actually dried out. It, it silted up at the heads and all sort of things happened. And the Aborigines for a long time could walk across very easily from the Geelong area over to here to meet, to meet up. And then in one catastrophic moment that all collapsed, the water rushed in, the trees got knocked down, everyone got drowned, killed, everything was a terrible day of disaster. And that was recorded in Aboriginal oral history and, told, and they told Georgiana McRae, who was the early English diarist down at McRae on the peninsula, and the, and the fellow who was telling her that story, that the problem said, no more walk Carayo, no more walk Carayo. Very, very worried he was, because Carayo, of course, is the Geelong area. And from now on, those young men had to walk all the way around the bay, a vastly greater trip than just crossing over the heads and being in Bunwarang territory. Anyway, on with the plants. This, I'll bring a few of these in close so you can see them. But this particular plant that you might be able to see has got a little yellow flower, a little sawtooth. That's called hop goudinia. And like I said, every plant's got a, a use, but it's very difficult at times to be, to even guess what it was. And you wouldn't guess what this one's for. Well, what would happen with a campfire around here when there's a new baby born and the baby started teething, they'd start crying and upsetting all the old fellas sitting around the fire talking about hunting or something. So the mothers would take a bit of hop goudinia, drop it into the fire, and as the smoke rose, they'd hold the baby in the smoke and the baby fall asleep. It's an actual natural soporific. Very interesting. I've got to, if you come around here, in this area the dominant plant mostly all through here is what we call bower spinach. 
it's uh, got a very interesting shaped little leaf and it's quite edible I can eat that you can add it to salads quite well and it's fairly famous because of uh, Captain Cook Captain Cook took this on his voyages to New Zealand to keep his crew from getting scurvy and um, people commonly add it to salads in some of the more interesting Melbourne restaurants these days it's called bower spinach because in other areas around here if there's a big log it'll grow right up and over it and halfway up this tree and down again so it's a very interesting plant bower spinach and as well in here there is this long sinuous plant called um i'll come back to that i've forgotten the name for a moment and in here ragodia there's a bit of ragodia that's got a substantial little berry on it that's quite good for you but it's very sweet on the outside and very very bitter on the inside so that's another edible plant not eaten too often and um what else have we got in here um probably behind me it's of interest the bush there is boobiella mysopore we call it boobiella and boobiella has berries in the season and they're very sweet and good to eat a little stone in the middle the Aborigines would come and collect those in large numbers. So Bubiella was another important food in the area. Um, I think around the place here we've got uh, lots of wattles and uh, also, you know, the banksia, which is really fascinating with the banksia. I pulled off one of these banksia corn, uh, flowers a little while back, but the banksia in the mornings exudes a nectar. And the Aborigines would take a banksia flower like that quite a few of them, pop them into a dilly bag full of water and then let the scent and the nectar go into the water overnight so the kids could have a, the equivalent of a cordial. And um, the adults as well would let it mature for a few days and add a bit more of a few other plants and it would turn into alcohol, which you wouldn't expect. And finally, which I think is really nice for young girls when we're taking talks down here and we show them, the young girls would come down in the morning and take this this uh, plant and a much stronger bank is called a hairbrush plant because they could do this they could do their hair comb their hair make it look nice and fill it full of sweet smelling scent so it's a triple use of a fairly great little 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 flower just on our way out there's a couple of things here there's um tea tree it's called ti tree and tea tree these days we call it ti tree but then in the early settlers days they actually tried to make tea out of it. I've never tasted it but I don't think it would be much good. And here is the reason why we call that spinach I talked about, Captain Cook spinach and uh, Tetragonus is its Latin name, and bower spinach, because see the bower it forms? It will climb up anything and fall down, tumble down. This uh, plant is uh, climbing lignum the one I forgot to mention before or couldn't remember the name of and it's when treated is used for tying up baskets and many many other things like that very very handy very handy indeed now behind me you can see what we call a dead banksia and someone says why don't we knock out all the old dead banksias and uh, get rid of them because they look so unsightly well it so happens that once the banksia starts to die it rots out inside and when it rots out inside, it means that in particular, the rainbow lorikeets can dig in up the top and have nests. And when we came here this morning, this tree had five wonderful rainbow lorikeets sitting in it. And in December, January, you'll often find a female sitting with her head out here looking at you at this level. Very cute and great fun to know they're around. Even when I hit that, I can hear the, the hollowness within the tree. I might be getting the idea now that Every plant in this area has a use. There's a couple of other examples. Our coastal wattles down here, along the shoreline, they've got seeds which be ground into flour, little black seeds which ground up make a damper. And we might be able to go down and have a look at one later on our way to the beach for a couple of stories to finish this up. And their roots are also edible when mashed up. The roots are very rich in nitrogen. And if you mix the sap of the um, coastal wattle with that flowery powder from their seeds it makes a super glue 
a real, real super glue. The Aborigines use that, of course, to bind axe heads into their, their halves and things like that, then bind it up with that plant I just showed you. And so it was well tied in, well super glued, and would last quite a while. The other thing, of course, is the, uh, the eucalyptus and the tea tree. What's the use of eucalyptus? Well, there's two uses. Virtually every eucalyptus, when the oil is extracted, is a world-famous antiseptic with no side effects and pretty much the same for tea tree and tea tree oil. So they'd use those as well as in Aboriginal medicines. But that's another story, Aboriginal medicine. It was very widespread and we're still just beginning to investigate it fully. Another, another eucalypt of interest is the manna gum. We haven't got any here, but it's a gum with a long leaf like that. They're spread around the, the peninsula here in the foreshores, but and we're getting a couple planted in this area for the future. But manna gum has sap which is, comes out when it's drilled by a special beetle and that sap drops to the ground and it turned out to be a really great chewing gum. All the whites got onto it very quickly as well as the Aborigines. So it's another thing that they have which you wouldn't have expected. Soft drinks, alcohol, chewing gum, most of the vices. That plant down there is known as pig face, that's what everyone calls it. We now call it these days Carcalla rossii. Carcalla being the Aboriginal word for it. And it looks very innocuous. But in fact, there are three really important foods here. Unfortunately, we can't see them all today. But if I take that, if you're really dry, there's no water and you're in trouble in the bush in Australia, just eat one of these. And when it's finished, I'll just show you what, how much water comes out. I'm eating the carbohydrate part, the fibre that's left and spitting out the, uh, a few bits and that water because it's a bit sour the water and I wouldn't advise it but it is very good for you if you need it, if you're starving or if you're, not if you're starving but if you're dehydrated. The great food here though is that when the season's right in late winter there'll be big flowers and under the flowers, we'll grow here, will be a corm underneath it about the size of a big gum nut. And if you cut that out, you can eat it straight. That tastes exactly like fig. Hugely nutritious. So you might be getting the, 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 uh, the message down here now that virtually everything around here has a purpose and a use. And here's a nice little shot of the coastal banks here I showed you earlier. This is uh, March and they're just beginning that's expanded from something like my finger in only a few days. These are about two weeks old and they're maturing very quickly. They go into a hard nut in the end. But it's a beautiful plant. We're very lucky to have it. And here's another plant with an unexpected use. This is weeping shear or casuarina. And um, we made boomerangs out of these. If you look underneath it, you may see some of the curvature in the wood. Uh, but it made for natural boomerangs and very, very tough, strong boomerangs. Now this is a really interesting plant. It's called kangaroo apple. And um, I've just managed to find three stage of its berries. It's a very poisonous plant, so don't touch it, don't eat it, no matter what either anyone else says, leave it alone. The Aborigines ate it though, and they planted these all the way up to places like Cooktown. That was a way they could track that they were on the right track going there, and there's food along the way. In the first stage, it's got a little green berry, like that little green berry there, and that's really poisonous. The second stage, The berry is turning yellowy red. There's a red version, a fairly yellowish version. And that has another purpose, which is secret women's business. And the final stage, oops, 
It turns bright orange and is edible. I've eaten a few but I wouldn't recommend it because uh, you really need to know what you're about and I only ate it to make certain if I got hurt no one else would do it. Uh, but that's how it turns out and that's sort of mushy, tasty like a bit of mushy um, pumpkin. So three stages. Now why is it called kangaroo apple? Well you can't see it at the moment in the nature of the plant but when the plant um, when the plant is in the right season its leaves form something just like that only a little more obvious than that and it's a kangaroo paw the shape of a kangaroo paw and in the season you'll see many of the leaves in the shape of beautiful kangaroo paw this time of the year the end of the flowering and fruiting they're just single leaves this bush of which we've only got two or three in, in this particular area in the uh, tea house gardens is uh, coastal beard heath. It's a beautiful tree and the reason why it's so beautiful is that in the uh, right season which is I think late winter the entire tree is like a snowball. Masses of white flowers with small berries that again are sweetly edible except the birds know that as well so it's normally competition between those of us who like the berries and the birds. So we've planted a couple more of these in the hope that they'll take because to be processed they need to go through a bird system like many seeds. The many seeds have to go through a bird, pick up the bird lime and then get deposited before they'll actually grow. So this is one of those special trees. <laughs> This is the coastal wattle I mentioned before with its seeds, its nitrogen fixing root systems and it's um, the mixture of the sap and the seed forming super glue. And by chance here along the path we've got the coastal sea berry um, salt bush, uh, Rigodia, which has the lovely red berries and those red berries stain brilliantly red. So if you're taking children on a walk down here, letting them play with that, the girls rub it on their lips, it's usually good fun. Unexpectedly bright, isn't it? The use of this would be doing yourself up for a, um, a didgeridoo party or something. Okay, we're now going to go down onto the beach itself for just a couple of small stories that were pertinent to the Aborigines in this area. There's a classic interchange here of two plants doing a great job. The, uh, the salt bush, pretty common throughout Australia but very special on beaches because the salt bush pulls the salt out of the soil and holds it under its leaf. So the soil's now desalted from here on up, all the way along the beach the same too. If you look down the beach later you'll see salt bush all the way. And then next we have our coastal wattles and our coastal wattles are pulling nitrogen out of the air and pumping nitrogen into the soil. So the soil is nitrogenised, which is really good, and desalted. As a result, if we kept swimming, swinging the camera, you see behind it the line of big trees that can then grow and grow happily and healthily. I'd just like to mention a couple of things that, about the Aborigines locally and the Gataquilum. Um, they uh, played games here. And one of the games they played, which I thought was really cool, is that in that dry seagrass along here, you'll often find seagrass gets made into balls. Surprisingly enough, they're very tough, and it, the way it wraps itself up. And when it's made into a ball, they, the uh, Aborigines would then put some clay through it, or some wax from here from the tree, or sap, and the girls would roll that. Keep, keep walking, you're very welcome that the average would roll that down the beach at high speed and the girls would do that and the boys would be further down with their little spears trying to throw spears and hit it as it went past. A great game and really build skills with those Aborigine kids. But I think that's about the end of this, uh, this session. We've covered everything except perhaps the spin effects down here on the ground and that's kind of interesting. The spin effects is a dune stabiliser and that's really important so the sand doesn't all blow away. And when these long runners come, if they're blown back by the wind, they actually root on a stress point. So that's pretty, and they've got a lovely colour too. So thanks for listening, 
and uh, we look forward to perhaps another video on some other subjects in due course. <laughs> Kalau nanti nak.